Good afternoon, folks. Welcome, everybody. We're here with Community Nature Connection and Richard Bugby today for the Cultural Burning Practices in California training and webinar. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. We'll let folks uh, flood into the virtual room. Very excited to have you all here this afternoon. So as folks join, I will begin with a little introduction. Um, you are here with Community Nature Connection, and this is the Cultural Burning Practices in California training with Richard Bugby. My name is Celeste Gasparic, and I use she, her pronouns. I am the Director of Training and Impact with Community Nature Connection, and I'm joining you today from Tongva Land, otherwise known as Northeast Los Angeles. So I would love to get to see where all of you are joining us. Type your introduction into the chat. Um, we'd love for you to share your name, pronouns, where you're joining from today. Um, if you're uh, representing any organization today, give them a shout out. And then we encourage you to share what ancestral land you're joining from today. And if you're not sure, you can look it up um, and we will pop a link in the chat right now for you to do so. Uh, I wanna let folks know that closed captioning is available for this training, and you can view those by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. And we will begin today's training by acknowledging the land on which Community Nature Connection operates as the ancestral lands and home of the Tongva, Gabrielino, Tatavium, and Chumash people. We recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture, and pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Community Nature Connection strives to create partnerships and collaborate with local tribes in our efforts to expand equitable, equitable outdoor programming to all. Um, and a little bit about our organization. If you're not familiar, Community Nature Connection is a nonprofit community based organization serving the Los Angeles area, um, Tongva, Tataviam, and Chumash lands. Our mission is to increase access to the outdoors for communities impacted by racial, socioeconomic, and disability injustices by eliminating existing barriers through advocacy, community centered programming, and workforce development. And today, um, this training is part of our program, the Training Institute. The Training Institute provides community and certification training opportunities, aiming to increase knowledge and skills and representation in the outdoor field. So thanks very much, everyone, for being here. Um, I appreciate everybody um, chiming in with their introductions. Great to see where folks are joining us from today and um, who, what orgs you're representing and everything. So welcome. If you're just joining us now, please do drop your name and um, where you're joining us from, pronouns, ancestral lands, um, into the chat. And we can get to see who's all here. Um, so uh, just a tiny bit more housekeeping before we get started. Um, for uh, the Q&A, we will do um, question and answers at the end of the session. So if you do have questions that arise throughout today's session, go ahead and drop those into the Q&A box. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen, you can click on the Q&A and enter a question. And you can check out other people's questions in there too. You can upvote them um, and we can um, take time to answer some of your questions at the end. Um, and also we are recording this training and we will be able to post it on our YouTube channel. Um, so in case you wanna share it with anybody else, um, you'll be able to access it there um, afterwards. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our training for today. Richard Bugby is Payunkucham and from Northern San Diego County. He is an instructor of Kumeyaay Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology at Cuyamaca College through Kumeyaay Community College. He is the chair of the board of directors for the Advocates of Indigenous California Language Survival 
and he's on the boards of Indigenous Regeneration, Climate Science Alliance, and Intertribal Fire Stewardship. He is currently using his ethnobotanical and ethnoecological knowledge to reintroduce cultural burns and other traditional practices to land management agencies to teach them how to steward the land. So welcome, Richard. Thank you very much for being here today and take it away. Niyom, Michi Shuikam, Lovikup, no tungi pakushmak yaka tachi, no tung Richard Bugby yaka, no pionkulish. Um, like, like I said, my name's Richard Bugby, and uh, I'm a uh, pionkuchon was also known as Luceno, though, uh, meaning we're uh, attached to the missions of San Luis Rey over by uh, Oceanside. I'm actually from Paula and Palma reservations, a uh, little inland. Um, and uh, um, I learned from my grandfather, uh, John Peters, and uh, my teacher, Jane Dumas Thing. Um, and uh, uh, um, my grandfather was Luceno, and my, and, and, uh, my teacher was. Uh, Kumiai. So I, I, um, I understand both Kumiai and, and uh, Luceno, uh, and, and I try to use as much language as I can. And so my presentation today is one of the things I, I um, remember doing a long time ago is doing a fire dance for, um, it was a movie called Wild California. And we we're doing a fire dance, and and in the fire dance, we end up stomping out the fire with our feet, and uh, and it's it was part of a ceremony, and in the ceremony, it was um, it was done in in a, a, a fire for to enhance the land or to gather game or um, or other things, but but it, it always had a purpose and a ceremony, and it's it was called Chapena. Chapena is 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 uh, um um. Let's see if I have it up here. Yutlovik uh, is Yutlovik uh, is means a uh, Yut uh, is a fire, and Lovik means it's good. So it's Chapena is a good fire, a good fire, a fire lit in a circle in several places. That burns to the center, so it's um, um, kind of like a control burn, but we call it a cultural burn. Um, uh, and we did this thousands of years ago, and uh, um, our firefighting equipment was basically our feet. And uh, well, today we have fire protected clothing and and. Uh, uh, Oh, helicopters and airplanes to help us uh, control the these burns. Um, you think we'd have a, a better uh, handle on it? So we have this other fire called Yut uh, Pomuli Kala, um, and it, this that's a wire wildfire or a fire that burns itself. Um, we use the reduction of fuels from uh, that's caused by wildfires to facilitate cultural or cycladic mosaic burns. Um, wildfires are destructive while cultural burns are revitalizing. And then we'll, I'll show you some uh, statistics that show why that, that, why that is later. Um, the, the, so one of the th thoughts I had, and, and I'll, I'll hit it again at, towards the end, is is California is really overgrown, and to kind of start this regime of of using fire to to keep the the ecosystem he healthy is to um, go where the land has already been burnt and and kind of revive that land. 
Um, and, and then I'll show you other ways that we can uh, facilitate that. So chipena is done in ceremony. It's done in cycletic, cyclical mosaic burns or cultural burns, meaning the burns are smaller than a control burn. And, and, uh, uh, um, um, and uh, uh, but more frequent. Uh, and the burns are actually there to benefit the different plant and animal communities and ecosystems, not to get rid of fuel. Um, um, we don't even want to consider the, the, what everybody else considers fuel. We want to consider as plant and animal communities or plant communities and to, um, keep everything in balance. So this is a, a actually, so the land with its plants and animals had a reciprocal relationship with the indigenous people for tens of thousands of years. Now for the last 500 years, the plants, animals and land have felt abandoned and don't know what to do. We are losing our grasslands and meadows to chaparral plant communities. We have already lost much wetlands to human population. This is uh, some of the land up on top of Mount Palomar. Um, and you can see where it's kind of nice and open right there. That was all full of uh, chaparral that was 15 to 20 feet thick. I mean, tall. Uh, um, and it was covered the whole mountain. What they did is they brought in these um, um, masticators and now they're gonna clean up this duff and then they're gonna do a, uh, a burn. And I kind of almost don't wanna call them burns. It's, it's, I call them cultural burns, but, but you're more like, you're kind of like searing the land. You don't really want it to, to, to scorch the land. And the main difference between a good fire and a bad fire is uh, a bad fire, when you look at it, it's done, it, everything is white. And a, and a good fire, when it's done, everything is, is, is black. And that means there's a lot of charcoal, a lot of uh, 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 cleansing going on with the environment and everything's good. So this is about 5,500 feet in, uh, at uh, Mount Palomar. It happens to be on my uh, my uncle's land. It's kind of cool. So I was pretty excited to be up there. You can see Big Bear. You can see the islands. You can see Mexico. See everything from up there. So one of the things, this is a kind of my rules for gathering, but it's also my rules for interacting with, uh, with the land. Um, a lot of people want to call it uh, Indian land management, and I don't like the word management. And uh, so I like to, I use the uh, Indian land relationships, or it could be Indian uh, um, native uh, land interactions. Uh, so the first thing my teacher taught me um, uh, was uh, when I approach a plant to uh, offer a prayer, ask permission, and then tell the plant what you're going to use it for, because plants are have can do multiple things, and that directs their energy into doing what you need need the plant for. Um, about forty years ago, my teacher I uh, I used to watch her talk about plants. She she um, would talk about plants. Everybody be really be interested in what she was talking about, but they never knew what plant she was talking about because she'd always say the plant was Beth Dye or Lacey Sage, or she always had strange names for the plant, not strange names, but different names for the plants. Um, so she would talk, uh, I would listen, and for about two years, I would just go listen to her. Um, and then one day she said, oh, you're interested in plants. I said, yeah. And she said, you want to come to my mom's gathering place? I said, yes. And so I went there. I, um, 
um, we went in the parking lot of, of the, it was a steel canyon, a steel bridge by 94 there. And she said, I want you to dig up that, uh, that thigh in the parking lot. And, and I, and but she said, before you dig it up, I want you to offer a prayer, ask permission and tell the plant that we, what we're doing, you were going to, we're going to dig it up and I'm going to take it home. Um, Pithai is a white sage. And, oh, there he is right there. Um, so there's a bunch of kids by the bridge. And so I started talking to this plant and saying a prayer to it and asking permission and tell it I was going to dig it up and, with the elder and take her, take her home. And um, when I got done, I looked up and all the kids had left. I guess they thought I was a, a crazy person talking to a plant. Um, I later on found out you don't have to do all that stuff out loud. You can <laughs> kind of mind meld with a plant as long as you do it. Um, and I also found out, I don't found out, but I kind of feel that if I do it in the language that I'm, where I'm at, then, then the plant feels more at ease about it. Um, so th this is how I always um, um, gather my plants. The second question, sometimes I ask permission and sometimes the answer is no. And that's happened a few times. I drove one time, I saw some, a quinai. Quinai is um, Juncus textilis. And I was gonna get, it was really nice stuff. And I was gonna get some for the, for uh, my teacher to weave baskets with. And so I offered a prayer, asked permission, and said, I'm gonna use it for basketry. And when I reached in the, to grab a, a, a stock, it uh, stabbed me in the arm. I took that as a no. And I, I walked back to the truck and I, I told my teacher, I said, it said no. And she said, okay, let's go. She was okay with it. So this is um, uh, uh, Beth Dye, which is the white sage and the, the, the bees on the um, lemonade berry. And creosote is in the upper left, which is a very uh, powerful medicinal plant from the desert. So burning fire was the most significant, effective, and widely employed vegetative management tool of California Indian tribes. This is Ishi up the center there. Ishi was a Yahi or Yani, one or the other. Um, um, uh, Indian from uh, Central California, who the miners had uh, wiped out the rest of his tribe to get their land so they could mine gold on it. And he went into a slaughterhouse to, um, to be slaughtered. Uh, instead, an anthropologist found him and, and took him to live at uh, UC Berkeley. And, uh, um, and he lived there and hunted in Golden Gate Park and, and, uh, um, um, and he taught us, uh, you know, showed a, lo a lot of things of, about his culture. And one of the things is, is um, uh, using fire. Uh, the one thing he wasn't allowed to say, he wasn't allowed to say his name. So no one really knew who his name was. They just need, named him Ishi because Ishi means man in the next tribe over his language. And I guess he was okay with that too. He wasn't okay. When he passed away, he asked that they didn't do an autopsy on him, on him and they did. And they um, took his brain to uh, the Smithsonian. And it really upset a lot of people. And they finally returned it and they reburied his brain back with him about maybe 10 years ago. Anyway, I used to work at the Museum of Man in San Diego. <clears throat> and one of my favorite things to 
to um, be around was uh, he made an arrow that's in there. It was in there, and uh, I used to like um, hanging on to that arrow for a little bit. So, so he taught us a lot about burning. So cultural burns versus control burns. Control burns targets acreage for fire breaks, treats plants as objects and fuels. Um, there's fewer of them, but they're larger. And they, they, they do get out of hand. And they're always done too late. Um, a lot of the that fuel needs to be removed before they they do those things like that. Well, cultural burns targets the health and of plant and animal communities, uh, causes fire, small fire breaks as a byproduct, um, treats plants as living beings, food, medicine, as uh, um, um, as what they are. Um, and then there's more, but smaller uh, plots are burnt. Because you're just targeting as one plant community. The first, you're gonna see a couple of videos. The first video is with the Mono people and it just targets their, I think they're red bud uh, plants. And it's a very small burn, but it's been done for like three or four years in a row. And uh, I kind of believe in this, this thing called uh, intergenerational harvesting, where you harvest the same parts of the same, same plant um, generation after generation. And the plants seem to say, okay, this is what you like. This is what I'm gonna give you. And I, I, I noticed that with uh, um, a lot with uh, Opuntia or uh, prickly pear cactus. The more you gather that, the more it likes it, the more, I think maybe because some of the plants just like to be disturbed. Um, you got to remember that plants and, and people are, have evolved for tens of thousands of years or probably hundreds of thousands of years. And, and uh, um, they're used to each other uh, doing what they do to each other. Um, So this is some of the, the um, um, differences between indigenous fire or uh, cultural burns or wildfires, which, which are um, just a wildfire itself. Um, you gotta remember in the old days, we didn't live in houses, we lived outside in the forest and, and the last thing we want, would want is a, a forest fire. Um, it would uh, be uh, devastating to us if we had all the fuel we have today and we're living outside. So we kept our house clean and we kept our house clean by having indigenous fires. Um, and with, with, with our wildfires, um, it, it it doesn't ben it it just doesn't benefit a lot of species. Um, I can't. It, it, it just burns too hot, and um, and with the emissions and carbons, it uh, um, creates a lot of toxins. Um, it decreases water detention. And then it increases greenhouse gases. And with the community, there's a loss of livelihood, loss of property and life, and a lot of trauma. With our indigenous fires, the um, biodiversity is, is it's benefited. Um, it heals the, the community and the quality of life and, and uh, uh, an economic opportunity is that the plants grow so that we can use them for food and medicine tools, whatever we need. 
And then the emissions and carbon, it, uh, um, we have the black carbon there and, and then the, the, it has that, uh, the charcoal is a toxin filter. filter. Um, and it also, it brings back the water because the plants that come back after a fire um, or after a, 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 a cultural burn are plants that hold water and not suck up water. The non-native plants that are there that are crazy, creating the problem are plants that suck up water and they lower the, the plant uh, water table. Um, so uh, with that uh, video with the monos, they noticed these little tiny burns they were doing on their red buds was causing the water table to um, rise. Um, there's also a, a, a video I show in my ethnoecology class uh, about um, wolves being restored to uh, Yellowstone. And the, um, um, and one of the after effects of, of the, the of it, it really increased the biodiversity of the land of both plants and animals, but it also raised the water table in Yellowstone. And uh, uh, just by uh, uh, um, putting back that apex predator. So indigenous land management or relationships, some of the techniques, there's not just burning, but there's uh, irrigating, pruning, coppicing, chopping the plant to the ground. Um, um, this coppicing is, uh, um, um, when you saw that, that photo of me up at Mount Palomar, that all that chaparral had been coppiced down with this machine called a masticator. <laughs> and, uh, but um, a lot of our plants are crown sprouters. And so what happened is we left a few old growth and then we chopped the rest of it down. But on the stuff we chopped down, they're crown sprouters. So fresh new growth is coming out of the out of these brown uh, sprouts and it's gonna uh, fill up nicely without uh, overcrowding itself and and uh, um, the right plants will fill up the gaps and everything will be cool a lot of the sowing we do is actually sloppy gathering because we gather the seeds at the right time and the different things at the right time. And we usually use the seed beater in a, in a burden basket and collect these things and, and knock the seeds out. But we kind of are sloppy about it because we want those seeds, same seeds to, to regenerate for next year. It's kind of like, um, uh, we, can, we don't grow corn here even though we have a word for for corn, but um, that's because I think we traded with it with the with, uh, Colorado River people. But um, the people in uh, the natives in Arizona, when they grow corn, they always grow a stalk in the middle and then they grow a bunch of stalks in a circle around that one stalk. And they only eat the corn on the, of the corn on the outside. They won't eat the corn on the inside. And the corn on the inside is for next year. So they'll have, always have seed for next year. And the corn that they eat on the outside always protects that corn for next year. And we're always thinking about what, what's the plant? We're gonna gather the plants so they grow good for next year. And we're always thinking about that. Tilling, tilling is mainly done with our di digging sticks, but not in rows. And we're usually um, dig to where we can get to a root, pull the root out of the ground and use that root for um, basketry or 
or whatever, cradle boards, whatever. Transplanting, we used uh, um, one plant that's easily, easily transplanted is a willow. Um, seems like you can stick a willow stick in the ground and it's grow. grow. You might, um, if there's a water source and might uh, put some shade over that water source to keep the evaporate, evaporation down. So some of the benefits of these, of these uh, um, relationships is game management. Um, what happens when you burn an area, it, uh, a lot of our seeds are fire dependent, so it causes new growth. The, the new growth is out in the open and the bunny and the deer have to go eat and, and the um, bunnies and the deers get real skinny and the Indians get kind of fat. And um, one thing I noticed when we um, did that thing in Mount Palomar was when we opened it up, um, it was 15, 20 foot thick of um, of um, mostly manzanita, um, but it was a lot had a lot of cyanothus in it too, and the deer couldn't get through it. It was like it was just the deer couldn't get through it at all. And when we cut paths and and made these little uh, um, meadows, and uh, the deer were loving it. Then we found out the the mountain lions were loving it too <laughs> because we didn't see any action, but we saw them following. <laughs> they were keeping a close eye on those deer. <laughs> and I guess if they would have, we would have yelled or something. <laughs> um, so, so it, it's, so by opening up that area, it was not only good for the land, it really helps the deer and, uh, um, There you go. Does anybody know why the deer are so small up there? They do. They're only like three feet tall. They're little tiny deer. Anyway, like little pygmy deers. Anyway, uh, it's also a way, the fires are actually a way of uh, gathering insects and insect control. Um, um, it would, uh, if we were doing this and we have that problem with the oak tree borer, um, I think that the the smoke from this when we'll talk a little bit about smoke would would actually um, uh, be a deterrent for for those to come around, uh, and uh, and the fire itself uh, um, would, would be a deterrent. It modifies the growth of certain plants. Uh, especially getting rid of the woody parts and and it increases certain species, increases the soil fertility, makes gathering easier, uh, opens it up so we can get to the things we can get to, we need to get to. Uh, changes the plant community composition, uh, kind of turns it back to native. Uh, prevent large destructive fires. That's a, a byproduct, but it's uh, it, that's what it does. Uh, eliminates diseased plants and harmful insects, and increases biodiversity. So this is a fire. Uh, the the little burn they do in North uh, the Norfolk Mono in the Southern Sierras, and this is a a, a group of students from. UC Davis came comes down and helps the tribe, and then uh, uh, the chairman is uh, Ron Good. And it's a a little two or three minute video. We're burning to restore the land, restore the resources. Restore water. Today we're burning the red bud and sourberry, which is a three-leaf sumac.
both of them are dying and they need new growth and in order to get that we burn it. Cultural burning is a traditional land stewardship tool employed by the indigenous people all over the world and it has a very strong history and contemporary practice in California. For the students to not only observe him as a land steward and to listen to his knowledge and the way he approached the work, but also to then be involved alongside him and to be guided by him in those methods really went even uh, beyond what I had planned for the class. Bring in you folks in class from UC Davis gives us an opportunity to share with you our traditional ecological knowledge and practice and see it firsthand. I keep telling everybody that for centuries when the Indians burned all the time, then they could they could come through and do a broadcast burn underneath, burn all these sowberries <laughs> without burning these trees. There's no doubt that fire suppression is one of the leading causes for the fires that we're seeing today in California that are so uh, damaging to communities. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, starting in the mid-19th century, but really in the early 1900s, Native people were prevented from burning across their traditional homelands. And now we're just seeing the result of that policy. We started this morning with the blessing. We started this morning by asking all our relatives out here permission to come out here. I'm not out here to destroy them. I'm out here to restore and make new life. The thing is that fires are going to burn whether we want them to or not. And what we learn from cultural burning practices is that Native American communities have learned to use fire to their advantage. We need to also learn how to use fire to benefit society. I see a lot of hope in collaborative uh, partnerships where we find state and private funding in which people can work together to prepare the land for a burn. So do that thinning, take out the overgrowth and the underbrush, do that raking and piling and burning before you can implement a burn. I think that's key. I think people need to be educated about what the land looked like for many years. The end. Oh, no, I started again. <laughs> okay. So that was uh, Ron Good. Uh, we used to sit on the, there used to be a Native American Advisory Council for the state parks until Governor Wilson dissolved it. And I used to be the youngest one on the, on the council until uh, Ron Good came along and then he became the youngest guy. Then they dissolved it, so it didn't matter anymore. Um, so one of the questions always comes up, seasonal timing and frequency, you know, when do we burn? Well, this is a little chart made by uh, Don Hankins. Don Hankins is a pyrogeographer for, is it, is it, but, uh, Cal State Chico or um, the, the University in Chico. Anyway, uh, uh, he put together this chart, but it's very iffy too. Um, um, so seasonal timing and frequency depended on the health of, of different plant communities, the fuel, the humidity, winds, which all are variable. So things change and and it's time to burn when it's time to burn. There is kind of a season. I remember uh, another uh, uh, a native firefighter that's really knowledgeable is uh, um, Bill Tripp. And he, he's, he's pretty uh, knowledgeable of, of, of what time of the year uh, we should burn. Not so much the frequency uh, that the fire, uh, how many, 
how many years are in between the, each fire. Um, and because we don't know, we don't know how much rain, we don't know if it had a lot of rain, a little rain. And you can see these in, in, these, uh, in this chart, it has five to 15 years, 10 to 50 years, four to 15 years. Those are pretty, those are pretty variable. <laughs> you know, those are not, <laughs> those are not Pacific either. And then you have the times of the month that, that you would burn these different things. And then there's different things like a, uh, you have riparian uh, 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 forests, which are kind of rivers. And, and basically those are willows and cottonwoods. But what if you have a rundle taken over? And if a rundle takes over, Willows and cottonwoods are, are a water-based community, and a rundo is um, uh, rundos that stuff that looks like bamboo that chokes up our waterways. Um, it turns it into a fire-based uh, community where you can't burn that anymore. And burning the willows is the only way you we can. Uh, um, our women wore uh, willow bark skirts, and the only way to extract the willow from I mean, extract the bark from willow, so it's soft. Is for after a fire. Um, a lot of things. Uh, we can't uh, carve a canoe out of the cottonwoods until uh, the the cottonwoods in a fire. Oh, you can never mind. You can actually hear. No, no, not in this one. Never mind. Um. So there's a lot of things that uh 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 um. That we go when we follow fires, we can get. That's where we get our our pounded or soft willow bark. It's where we get our cottonwood to make our canoes. Uh, it's also where our tobacco pops up and our dog bane and different plants that we need. So these are all variables, and those are these are just iffy things. What you have to know is to know your environment and to know what it's supposed to be looking like and 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 how it's supposed to be and then so it's all about observation and so this one is all about annually 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 and you and this one and then, and then uh it says annually and under the oaks annually under around the springs and i think it's just a, a kind of clean it up a little bit uh, and then every 10 or more years in Chaparral. Um, yeah, because you don't, you want them to grow a little bit so you can get some of the um, 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 products that the Chaparral can produce. This uh, hillside here, they're burning um, Quayuk or uh, deer grass. And it's used in our basketry. The, the long uh, uh, seed stalks are used to uh, make our baskets waterproof in, the, in the, the core of the coils. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't grow good unless it's a, a burnt like this in the wild. Um, I used to get mine from the, from the cemetery in Santa Monica, but <laughs> on the outside of the cemetery, not on the inside, because they had really long, um, seed stocks there. Um, there was a national park in up in Ventura and they had a native plant garden. They had a lot of deer weed in there. I mean deer grass, I'm not deer weed, deer, deer grass or um, quayuk. And, and uh, uh, they removed it because uh, it was a fire ha hazard. So I, uh, I took it home and I, uh, when I lived in Topanga, and I, um, I planted it at a bunch of places in my yard, here and there, and and most of them lived, but some of them didn't. And the ones that lived were I had wolves at the time, and the wolves were using this grass as a dental floss or something. They're chewing on it, doing something with it. But the ones they chewed on are the ones that survived. The ones they left alone are the ones that, uh, that didn't make it. Maybe they left it alone because they knew it weren't going to make it. I don't know. But, uh, 
but uh, uh, I just thought it was a little strange that the ones that got tugged on were the ones that made it. So, you know, the oaks you kind of want to, because you'll get a lot of leaf debris underneath oaks after a while. And it'll, uh, uh, it'll start to uh, um, make a haven for pests in there. Um, and around springs, you kind of want to keep the uh, uh, um, plant down because of the sucking up the water. Grasses, most of our grasses were fire dependent. We needed a, we had a saddle high grass here. Um, uh, the Spanish soldiers said this, that there was a saddle high grass that from Mission San Diego to Mission San Luis Ray, they never saw the ground because of this grass. And it was, um, I had a fire dependent seed. We uh, ate the seed as a, as a grain. We used the, the, the stalks as a thatching. We used, uh, we burnt what was left. It caused new growth because it was a fire dependent seed. The uh, animals would come out and eat the new growth. We, we have fresh uh, animals. Um, but um, the, the people that came here thought that we were, when we burnt the, the when we did the burning, that we were burning the, the food for their cattle. And they didn't understand that we were causing more stuff to grow. They thought we were being destructive and they, they made us stop burning, which was a bad mistake. So smokes and version layer is a very effective insect and other destructive pets, pest repellent. Smoke inversion layer keeps the water temperature down for aquatic life. Uh, most of these burns that take place with native people are actually in Northern California. I think the next video is, is one of, in, of Trex, which is a training exercise or, uh, uh, for firefighters. And so the, they're really concerned because our, our, our food down here is, 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 is all about acorns and their food up there is all about salmon. So our agencies that fire our fire uh, wildfires are the best there are. These same agencies also failed in their fire su suppression techniques. The two greatest failures were Smokey the Bear and Leave It Alone and the replanting of forests with conifers and not the fire resistant oaks. These agencies need to work with uh, us techies. <laughs> Oops. Um, uh, or traditional ec ecological knowledge. People like Cliff Devers, who r runs uh, Palma Reservation uh, up at Mount Palomar there. Uh, uh, Ron Good, who you saw a video of. Don Hankins, you saw his crafts. Margot Robbins, you can see a, a little video of her. Um, a Bill Tripp, who's a Yurok firefighter. Uh, Frank Lake that works with, uh, um, I think he's uh, Korok, but he works with uh, uh, a U.S. Forest Service, I think. Willie Pink, uh, who does, um, who's a, another one that's, there's a few of us that are down, Cliff Devers and Willie Pink are, are, are the only ones that are down here. And Willie's a Cupeno that uh, is a fire fo follower that really, really puts the, uh, um, um, he, he makes like canoes and, and um, he like uh, uh, built a village out of uh, tule and willow and, and he set it on fire just to see how, how fast it would burn. And it didn't burn fast. He said we, we could have got out. And so there's a lot of people working on uh, 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 putting together uh, um, a lot of people working that putting Indians back into 
uh, working with the land with fire. Uh, last October, Newsom signed a law that uh, um, natives can be considered uh, um, fire bosses uh, without going through the governmental agencies and and, uh, and and such that just by their traditional knowledge. And a lot of this knowledge, I, I believe a lot of the knowledge comes from genetic memory. Um, Cause I work with language a lot. A lot of people dream in their language before they learn it. And then they have to learn the languages to find out what they're dreaming about. It's just kind of weird, but it's the way it works. And, and they do. And, and it, um, one of the, um, um, one of the things I used to be a dancer and one of the things I used to do is dance around the world and one of the places I danced was in Australia um, I ended up living over there for a little bit living with the Munanjali Yogam Bay people um, doing fire uh, uh, fire techniques um, mainly learning how to do that stick <laughs> Because that's that's what they do when they greet you. They make fire, um, but they do the same thing. Uh, they call it fire stick, uh, where they do these low intensity burns. And and I don't. I, I most of you know they have really horrendous forest fires in Australia, and because of the eucalyptus trees are, they burn pretty good, <laughs> and. Uh, um, um, so they have to have a really um, good fire. Uh, suppression program uh, uh, and what the Australian government has been doing is putting um, Aboriginal people in charge of their own lands as far as fire suppression and do, dealing with it the way they've always dealt with it and uh, it seems to be working out uh, uh, um, so far now they just have to get them closer to like Sydney and the more populated areas. But it's, 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 they're working on it. So the coniferous forest, that's the one thing I have about, um, um, they tend to, um, something's burnt, they want, they want something that grows back fast. And the thing that grows back fast are, are, conif are conifers. And conifers grow back fast, but they also, they grow, if they're growing all together, they're, they're going to um, have the same competition for light. And so they're, they're going to crowd themselves out. That means they're going to touch each other. And, and that means um, uh, a fire danger. So it, if we were to burn it, we would keep the forest relatively open with little litter and brush, and it would reduce the competition. Uh, uh, trees would be um, um, spaced apart. Um, it removes the diseased and aged trees, which is, increases biodiversity, uh, keeps certain species from taking over extensive area. And here's some pictures of a uh, burn and non-burn. Um, I'm down here in San Diego, um, and um, we have the Cuyamaca Mountains, and and uh, in our creation story, um, or in the Kumeyaay creation story, uh, the the oaks and the and the pine trees had a big battle on the mountain and the oaks won. So that means the black oaks stayed up high in the mountains. And if you know about oaks, black oaks are high. They are high, they're going to grow hot in the high elevations. Well, they won the battle and they sent some of the pine trees to the east and they became the pinyon pines. And they sent some of the pine trees to the west and they became the Tory pines. And like most plants, 
in, in native languages, every kind of oak has a different kind of name and every kind of pine has a different kind of name, except for pinyon pine and tory pine have the same name, Wu. And Wu to me means that's the one you look for. Wu is to look for something. And, and um, uh, so that makes sense with that story. But it said, but they left a couple pine trees up in the mountains here and there, but never no continuous. They never were continuous. They were just here and there. And, and what's happened is it's, it's the opposite now. The pine trees are everywhere and there's just an oak tree here and there. And um, so what's gonna have to happen is when you have these forest fires, they're gonna have to be replaced with um, um, the slow growing oaks. I was working on a farm for Mesa Grande and the farmer kept putting these plants in the ground and saying, oh, this has a 30 day turnaround. This has a 60 day turnaround, meaning from the time this plant was put in the ground to the time you can pull out a, an eggplant or a carrot or whatever they're growing, lettuce, whatever. You know, there's that many days. And so I planted a black oak there and I said, this has a 60 year turnaround. He didn't, he didn't like that to me, so. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to wait that long. So here's an example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, shoot, I knew what this was too. I forgot. Anyway, this is an example of a chaparral plant and that's been through a fire. In, and I guess the one thing I guess there's be missing in this picture is someone gathering what they need to gather before this fire and then after the fire. Say if this was elderberry, um, um, all this black stuff on these, these stems, uh, the bark can be collected because elderberry has that soft bark that you can use for padding and skirts and all that stuff too. But you can see this is a crown sprouter. You can see that they're uh, all coming back from that burn and with a fresh and, and uh, um, herbaceous growth. So uh, fire on a chaparral, it opens up uh, areas, reducing the uh, threat of wildfires, keeps this stands uh, from uh, 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 from achieving maturity. Oops. Um, uh, there it is. Um, encourages herbaceous of uh, uh, fire, 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 firefighters, fire followers like fire poppies and such, increases browsing animal populations by letting them, they couldn't have walked through this stuff with, if this was grown, um, uh, uh, we've had all the foliage and stuff, they, they just couldn't have gone, but now they can go right through this and maybe even eat some of this if it's edible. Um, I think when you make the deer happy, you make everybody happy. I remember in Topanga, I, I was, it was dark one time and I, I, I went outside to get into a box and I knew my way in the dark to get there and I got to the box and I turned on the flashlight to open the box and there's there like four deer standing around me. Should I shut, so I shut off the light and went back inside and next day I heard my roommate all mad because some, somebody ate her garden. <laughs> and I, I, I asked her what's easier to replace your garden or those deer and she she agreed that it was okay they were hungry so this is a, a, a kind of a quote by jonathan lowe a linguist uh, languages have a lot of specific lo local knowledge built in um, the cultures have uh, evolved in a particular environmental context so they have an extraordinary amount of traditional ecological knowledge 
knowledge of the local species, plants, animals, the med medicinal uses of them, the migration patterns of animals, behaviors, behavior. So when a large, when the languages die off, much of that knowledge goes with them. When the children stop learning the language, they also stop acquiring that traditional knowledge. If we can recognize that culture and nature are uh, interlinked, then working on a bi biocultural diversity as a whole, as a subject, would be a more fruitful way of looking at conversation, converse, conservation. Um, languages are disappearing most quickly in Australia and Americas, and most quickly in California. Uh, California has over 100 languages. There's only about 50 of them spoke still. Um, Chomtele or the Luceno language was my tribe. I don't, I don't think we have 10 speakers, probably five speakers. I don't I, we don't have very many. Uh, Kumi and I got way down there. They got down to about maybe 25 speakers. Now they're about up to 100. They, they really have a, they teach a, a Kumiai 1, 2, 3, and 4 at a, a Kumiai Community College. And it's a, it fulfills a foreign language uh, um, thing. I, they, were, they were teaching a, a Luceno at a, Palomar College, but I don't know if this still are or not. Um, I understand both languages. They're, they're about as close as English and Chinese. They have no, nothing the same. Their grammar is nothing the same. Um, Kumiai has very little grammar and Luceno is all grammar. It's, it's the whole, everything is grammar. And uh, oh, we would like we were going to say our pronouns. I forgot to say my pronouns. It was it was no po chom, <laughs> and um, um, that's what I use because that's that's Luceno grammar for pronouns. It's, we don't have he or she's, so I just use. Uh, He, she, me, are. <laughs> I think that's where that came up. <laughs> so some of the solutions. Oh. Um, follow, follow wildfires and cycletic mosaic burnings or cultural burns. Treat the different diverse regions of California differently. Plant more plants and less conifers. If you plant trees, plant fire resistant oaks. Um, land managers with their modern technologies need to work together with traditional ecological knowledge practice, practitioners and their ancient knowledge and, and keep our plants, animals, and land healthy. That's what we need to do. And where do we start? Well, the, one of the things that uh, uh, um, Cliff Devers is, is doing up in Palomar um, you go up and you gather the, the, all the usable materials that, you, that are accessible. You cut, cut down or masticate the out of place plants, pile and remove or burn the debris. And then you go regather because you're, you opened up areas that you weren't, didn't be, you weren't able to access before and gather what you, another, uh, some more reusable materials. Um, and do a low intensity burn with the proper conditions and the proper times. And then you f follow that up with uh, uh, cyclical mosaic burns or cultural burns. And uh, uh, if we kept that up, we, we're gonna have a nice healthy environment. So this is Margot Robbins. I'm going to, I, I, I was getting along here. And this is Margot Robbins. She's, I actually know her from uh, language, and uh, uh, I sit on the um, um, Indigenous Fire uh, Board, uh, Fire Stewards, yeah. 
and she runs a trucks program for the Eurox, and she's done a lot for the fire programs. Um, you'll notice she, she has um, tattoos on her chin. That's how we identify California Indian women. We call them 111 sometimes because they're usually three bars, not always. Um, uh, Kumiai women and where and Southern California women have it a lot. They just women, the ones that have it, they they use a lot of makeup <laughs> and you don't see it a lot because sometimes you sometimes you can't work with face tattoos, I guess. Uh, and but they identify their clan. Um, um, no, normally, men when they're born in a village, they stay in that village. They live in that village for their, all their life. They always gonna marry outside their clan, which is probably outside that village. The woman comes from another village and comes into the husband's clan, but she has to keep her identity. That's who she is, and so there are clan markings. So this is Marco Province. This year's Trex is for the first time ever all local uh, people because of the COVID we were unwilling to invite people in from other areas to come help burn and get training and so we have the Hoopa Yurok Karuk tribes, the Cultural Fire Management Council, the mid Klamath Watershed Council, and then a couple of independent people that have come to help us burn. This spring is particularly critical to, for us to get fire on the ground because we are picking the last of our places that have been burned for hazel this spring. So we need to have hazel again next spring for the basket weavers. And so we need to get fire on the ground in, in the different hazel places. We burn two different hazel places. There's some hazel up in this unit, but this one is more of a prairie restoration. It is really gratifying to see all three tribes come together and work together to bring fire back to the land. We agreed when we put together the Yurok Hoopa Karuk Healthy Country Plan that the tribes can burn together just like we dance together, that this is good for the people and good for our homelands. This particular Trex burn is very historical in, in that we have all of these organizations have come together for this training exchange opportunity. It says a lot about the fire community and how we support each other and the collaboration that takes place within that community and, and you know how significant it is. It's very significant because you know either a Trex burn uh, you know on a prescribed fire or suppression fire or any other activity such as training uh, fire departments, you know, no, no political boundaries. They want to come together. They want to work together. They want to participate in these events and support each other. The training exchange is an organ is a program that's designed to bring folks like us together from other agencies, departments, and provide training opportunities for fire qualifications in prescribed fire and in operational qualifications. So, so folks that are here not only get the uh, opportunity to help put fire on the ground, but there's opportunity for them to get very important training that they would not otherwise be able to get. These kinds of opportunities are few and far between. So that's, that's what it does. It helps them get qualified at higher levels organizationally for, for promotional opportunities and career development. It is such an amazing thing to see a fire engine for Hoopa come down and a fire engine from a Kurukwe to come down and join the Yurok engine and, and tribal people from all from all three areas come together and work together to um, to do good work, you know, to restore the land. There is hazel up here, as well as wild potatoes and wild iris and some different kinds of teas and things like that, that will, once it's opened up, really thrive and, and reproduce and be healthy. So we're excited about that, too. We're hoping to, you know, in addition to make the acorns healthier as a traditional food, to also reinstate the grains from the prairies and the wild potatoes into people's diets. So we're reclaiming our food security.
And then, of course, deer are going to come into all of these places. <laughs> Traditionally, our people and other tribes as well used fire on a regular basis. Every year, different areas were burned, and there's a cycle of burning. Sometimes you will re-enter a place every three to five years, sometimes every eight to ten, depending on you know where you're burning and the prairies more often. And so this land was actually about 50% prairie, and it's only three percent of what it once was and so there was you know prairies would go on for miles and miles with uh with just you know some some oak trees on it and it was very open there was a lot more water in the river and in the creeks the everything grew in its proper place and fire helped maintain that balance. So like right now we have fir trees that are growing clear down to practically the river and that's not really where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be more up in the, in the higher country or conifer. But when the timber industry came in and that's their cash crop. And so they not only logged everything that was loggable, but then they paid people to replant trees every place, including the prairies. And so our landscape is very different than it used to be. You used to be able to see through the trees and up to the tree line every place or down to the river. And now there's so much brush, you can't see through it. So, but we're starting to change that as I drive up the road each morning and I can, the different places that we burned, you can see the skyline and it's such a wonderful feeling to know, you know, right, what we're doing is making a difference. Because of the wildfires, people's attention is really focused on fire right now. And mostly it's fire prevention, wildfire prevention. And so they realize the government agencies that the policy of excluding fire from from the forest has been a very dire mistake and the consequences are these huge mega fires that continue to get bigger and bigger and more and more and so people are starting to realize that we need to do more prescribed burns because it acts as wildfire prevention when you purposefully reduce the fuels so when we are doing cultural burns to propagate certain species, culturally important species. It's also doing fuel reduction. And plus, because of the fact that Native people have been burning for thousands and thousands of years, these different government agencies and other organizations are starting to realize that Native people do know more than a little something <laughs> about what the land needs and, and how to use fire. And so a lot of the different organizations and legislators are getting a hold of us and, and asking, you know, about wanting information about how, how did we traditionally take care of the land. This year's trip. So that was Margo. Um, she's a pretty neat lady. Uh, uh, I also have a, 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 a longer video for uh, 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 
Willie Pink, the, the, him following fires and, and taking the material from, from fires, or the plant material from fires. <clears throat> so, we keep talking about traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, one of the things we get that knowledge from is, is because uh, I have a picture of seven Kumeyaay women here. And the youngest one of these, of these seven is 105. The lady second from the left with her hands on her hips, she's, 100, she's 112. And I wanna stand like that when I'm 112. Uh, the two ladies bent over, uh, the second from the right is, she's 128. Next one over, she's 126. The one in the end is 120. She's 120. Look how straight she's standing up. She, well, yes, yeah, she's she's on a tripod, but that's that's still okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, what I use these this ladies for uh, uh, is the the amount of knowledge that gets passed down, because my my teacher was my grandfather. Um, in a tribal setting, it, uh, my teachers would be my grandfather, the, my grandparents. There's four of those. Uh, if you're being this old, you have great grandparents. There's eight of those. If you're living 120s, you got great great grandparents, and you know, uh, and so you you have uh, uh, eight of those, and it just it just or 16. Uh, anyway, so what it ends up is is nowadays we have students, and each each teacher has like 40 students, 30 or 40 students. In the old days every student had 30 or 40 teachers. And these teachers were all related to him who all cared for him and loved him and wanted him to have the best knowledge possible. And the amount of information that flowed down and the, and the, uh, and the quality of information that flowed down to each person was uh, immense. And especially since we went through uh, puberty ceremonies. So when you when you turn 13 or 14 years old, you knew exactly what you wanted to be in life and what you wanted to do in life, in the direction you were going. Uh, you knew if you wanted to be a singer or a hunter or, or a medicine person or whatever you wanted to be, and, and and all these relatives would help you do that. So what this says is Mahashwu Tipayamat no quite sure. I asked my teacher how to say. People need plants and plants need people. And then she says, my not quite sure. And she didn't say anything about plants. I said, oh, and it says what I, I kind of translated it. And it says, the creator watches over us all and takes care of the land of the people. And it was it was an exhibit I had at UCSD. And I like this title better. And so I named it that. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, Here's the two organizations I'm with, Kumeyaay Community College and, and ICOS.org or Advocates. And uh, my, I'm Kumeyaay, I'm Payampuish, Kumeyaay Shui, which means I'm like a Kumeyaay, um, Manajali Yogombe, and I'm Teowina Maori too. And there's my how to get a hold of me, hanwit at AOL.com. And Thank you so much, Richard. That was a really excellent presentation. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon to share your, your knowledge. Um, I would love to uh, take a couple of questions um, from participants. If anybody has any questions um, for Richard, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A box. Um, and we'll take the last few minutes here to answer um, some of your questions. So I had um, one question come in a bit earlier about um, cultural burns and insects. And I know that um, Richard, you mentioned um, the effects of smoke as a really good pest repellent for the oak borers. Um, are there any um, concerns about cultural burns um, effect on the beneficial insects in the area? Well, 
people are always worrying actually about uh, mammals too. Uh, and, and a lot of animals live underground and they're not, they're not gonna be affected by low, low intensity burn. And what we looked at with with uh, with uh, Margot's thing, that was a very high intensity, low intensity burn, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, our burns are like way; it, they just kind of like creep along the ground very slowly. Um, the smoke would drive the insects away um, if they didn't like it. Then that's their problem. You know? <laughs> uh, but I can't see. Um, and then, and also before we burn those things, we, we, uh, um, oh, there's so many terms for it. I call it laddering, where you, where you cut the, the bottom branches off from the ground so the fire doesn't reach the, the branches of a tree to, to go up. And, and um, uh, most of the, um, uh, their homes are up in the trees, so that wouldn't that wouldn't you know uh, harm them either. No, there's and you got to remember these plants and animals have evolved for tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years to be accustomed to these burns, to deal with these burns. Uh, uh, um, they're actually probably wondering why they're not happening <laughs> more than bothered that they are happening. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, and I mean, that's a that's a great thing to understand is that the fires are very much on the ground level and not spreading up to the trees where uh, that's, which are the that's where it becomes a problem when it gets to the canopy. That's yeah. a problem. The, right. And the can and it's actually a problem if the canopies touch. They should be here and there, you know, spaced apart and let sunlight in to let the other the little guys go, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, like knowledge or resources for um, areas in the north of Canada? We have a participant um, joining us from Canada and asking about like proper time and conditions to do a uh, cultural burn there. You'd have to, um, you'd have to ask some local people from that that ecosystem because or that environment because uh, they would know the rhythms of that of uh, you know like I lived in Colorado in Grand Junction Colorado and there was a um, oh, what was it called Grand Mesa or something there was a mace, big mesa with the face of the mesa there and when it snowed it made a, a sw the design of a swan but the Indians didn't do something until that swan's neck melted. Wow. And so we, no one knows when that swan's neck's gonna melt. It, when it melts, it's that time. <laughs> yeah. We really didn't have a scheduling problem back in the old days, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we can't burn today. I have, a, I have a meeting, I have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Yeah, it's harder for the swan's neck to tell you when your next Zoom meeting is. Yeah. <laughs> but but it'd have to be someone that knows that area and knows about I couldn't go over and say, oh, this is time to burn in, in late January. And I don't know. I don't know what their weather and what their conditions are. Maybe they get windy then, you know. Wind's a big that's a big unpredictable thing. You know, you don't you don't burn when it's windy. It's just not smart. <laughs> um, and so with the, just a couple minutes left, we'll, um, I think, end it on this last question. Seems like a nice way to conclude. Um, what is your favorite or most, the most important lesson that you've learned from fire? Hmm. <laughs> Um, how, how much of a, how much of a medicine it is and like any other medicine, um, a little bit of medicine is okay. 
that too much medicine, it, the medicine becomes poison or it becomes bad. So too much of a good thing can be bad, but you need, still need that, a little bit of that thing to, that medicine to heal the earth. And it, and it actually, it's actually my first memory. <laughs> When I was a little, when I was like four years old, some kids started a fire in the in, in behind my house, and I ran in and got my dad's gas mask. I don't know why he had a gas mask. And I put it on, and I wanted to see what the center of fire looked like. So I did. And so all you people don't have to do it. It looks exactly like the outside of fire. <laughs> wow. <gasps> Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that, that memory and um, that lesson with us, fire is medicine. Um, and with that, we'll um, close today's training. want to give a huge thank you to Richard Bugby for joining us this afternoon and sharing his knowledge um, about cultural burns. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn from you and thank you everybody else um, for joining us, all the participants for being here today, for asking questions. Um, I wanna make a note that we will be um, sending up a follow-up email that'll have a survey for y'all to give us your feedback and also that this um, training will get posted on our YouTube channel. I'll send you the info in the email as well. And lastly, um, check out our upcoming trainings. We have one coming up next month on um, snake ecology of the LA area. So check that one out and sign up. And with that, we'll close. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>